How about if we talk about work aim again this week? Real aim can only spring from real valuation of the work and long observation. We always start off with something distasteful like this. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of work. It's hard. People don't believe us when we say that. People don't believe us. But it's true. And eventually, if they stick around and they try it, then they start to believe us. And they don't like it so much. And they find less time for podcasts. <laughs> they find less time for meditation. They find other things more pressing. They find other ideas more interesting. Ospensky said, the work will find a way for you. To understand this, you need a constant relationship to the work in the depths of you, in your soul, as it were. Something deep inside of you needs to be connected to this work. It can't be just an intellectual connection. It can't be just a connection of emotional curiosity. It has to be a genuine, real, sincere, deep connection with the very depths of you, whatever is most real in you. And then you will understand that this work will find a way for you. It's the work, really, that changes us. Now, I know that I said that the light cures us, and it does, but where did you think the light came from? What do you think channels the light to you? It's the work. Well, what do you think the work is? Do you think it's just some system of ideas that have been written down and passed along from teacher to student over thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years? Because it is that, but it's not just that. The work is the child of conscious humanity. It's the child of something out of this world. It is an organism that was produced by the union of beings who found out what compassion really is, what love really is, the real deal. Not the things that we think about, not the little petty things that we think about, not our chippings, not our whittling on the red tree. These people got it. They got what real compassion and real love really is. Those people got together out of their compassion and love, and they gave birth to the work, the system. Now, the system, see, people, we're, we're so narrow. We think so narrowly. The system is so huge. The system is so old. It arises and passes away in time on this earth, in our ray of creation. It arises and passes away according to need. When there's a great need for this system, it arises. When the need is no longer so great, it passes away, which means it just goes off the radar, that's all. It doesn't mean it disappears, it just means it goes off the radar, and then it comes on the radar. So it comes in waves, actually, on and off the radar screen, according to humanity's need. Now, the three other ways, the way of the fakir, the way of the monk, and the way of the yogi, those ways have established religions that are always present on the earth. That doesn't mean they're always practiced properly, but they're always present. So the ritual is always there. The memory of them is always there. But the fourth way is a different thing. It doesn't have a religion that represents it because it can move in all religions. It doesn't have those kinds of boundaries. I'm not saying that the boundaries are bad and wrong and the fourth way is the only way. I'm not saying that at all. The other ways are great. Thank God for them. Thank God for the people who genuinely practice them and teach them and who genuinely, sincerely follow them. That's good. It's good for mankind. It's good for humankind. But the fourth way is, is apart from that. It's something that, that is the love child of the conscious circle of humanity. Obviously, I feel very emotionally about this. But then, it's my life. I mean, this is my life. This has been my life for years. It doesn't matter what suit the fourth way is wearing now. It doesn't matter what tie it has on. It doesn't matter whether it's a blue serge suit or a charcoal gray suit, whether it's a white shirt or powder blue shirt, whether it's a striped tie or a paisley tie. It doesn't matter. That's not important. The importance is that it is presented in a way that people can connect with in different times, in different ages, in different eras, and in different needs, and with different hearts. So... For me, the fourth way is, is a connection with the highest and the most wonderful that I can imagine. For a lot of people, that would be God. But for most people, their idea of God is so limited for me that I don't even like to use the word. I just don't like to use the word because you have Shiite Muslims and fundamental Christians using the same word for somebody who wants them to go kill other people. This is not my idea of the highest and best for humankind. It's just not. And so I have a very difficult time using words just like Gurdjieff did. He had a difficult time using words that other people used because of what they did with them. 
So he invented words. And that's what Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson is all about. He's got a whole invented language almost. It's very difficult to read, but it's worth it because he cared enough to go through the trouble to find a way to try and get this precious truth to people. Because it is. This is life. This is life blood. Without this, this is like air. This is like breathing. Without this, we're lost. I don't know if you feel that yet, but I feel that deeply. And because of that, I understand the work will find a way for me because I have a constant relationship to the work in my depths, in my soul. And when you have that, you will understand the work will find a way for you as well. The work changes us because it brings the light. The work brings us closer to higher centers, which are always telling us what to do, how to live our real lives, not how to live these petty little lives, how to get the game console you want, how to save the money or how to find a way around, how to get dad or mom to agree to let you go into your savings to buy it, but our real lives, our real inner lives, the lives that don't depend on the things that happen out there, the things that we can get out there. That kind of life, that real inner life, that's the one I'm talking about. That's the important part of you. That's the real you. That's the you that I'm after. That's the you I come and knock on your head and expect to come to the door and answer. That's not the you I very often get to see. When I come and knock on your head, you send the machine out. You send the butler, you know, Mr. Machine out to answer. It's sad, but what? It's the best you can do right now. And until you can do better, what can I do? I'll try and set an example. I'll try and not send Mr. Machine out to meet your Mr. Machine so they can have a conference of machines. We can see what that's about in the world. The United Nations, the legislature, the Senate, the Congress, the Parliament, all those things all over the world. All they are is a congregation of machines. It's dead people running the world. Why is the world such a mess? Because dead people run it. Machines are running it. Well, but you're saying that all those people are dead? Yes. That's right. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying all those people are dead to their real self, to their real inner lives. They are dead to this work. They are dead. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Now, can they be revived? I don't know. Possibly. That's really not my job. My job is not to go around raising the dead. My job is to teach the people who come. Interestingly, I checked the other day, which I rarely do, but probably once a week I'll check FeedBurner to see what's going on in the podcast world. Estonia, the Ukraine, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Belgium, France. People are listening in all of those countries. I didn't even know they spoke English in those countries. They would have to, you would think they would have to speak English in order to listen to what I'm saying. And I thought, you know, we're just, we're so American, we're so provincial, you know, we're so limited. It's so difficult for us to think outside of this huge nation where we all speak one language. It's difficult for us to imagine, you know, that people living in countries that all speak different languages that will fit inside of Texas, one of our states. It's hard for us to imagine that, but it's how it is. We owe those people something. You know, those people, they can't be here, but we owe them something. We owe them camaraderie. We owe them love. We owe them goodwill and loving kindness because they too want to wake up because they too want to be alive, because they too want to find their real lives. And this work is universal in that. It doesn't care what country you're in. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care whether you're male or female, or you're black or white or green or yellow or orange. It doesn't care. All it cares about is do you want to experience your real life, your real life, not this acquired life, not this projected life, not this made up life, that this world has built around us like a barnacle. But do you want to break through the crust and do you want to experience the real soft underbelly of yourself and find that it is stronger and more powerful than anything that you've ever dreamed of in this universe? Because that's what this work is about. Higher centers are always telling us what to do, how to live our real lives. But we don't hear because of the mechanical parts of centers and the traffic of life. Yesterday, the parrots got out. I left the lock off the cage. It's not enough to have the lock on the cage that the cage makers made. We have to put a padlock on the cage because they're such experts at getting out, such experts at picking locks, opening doors. Yesterday they got out and one stayed in the front yard and one took off. And Connie went looking for him. And she went calling him and she's down by the street. And our street used to be a little street where there wasn't much traffic. And it's a little country road so people didn't go fast. Well, that's changed. There are no little streets anymore. 
There are driveways left where people aren't racing, but pretty much there are no little streets in our town anymore. Our town's no longer a town, it's a city. And the noise from the traffic, she couldn't hear the bird if he called. We count on the bird to call out so that we can hear where he is and then go find him. As you can tell, we're practiced at this. Yes, it's because I leave the lock off the cage from time to time so that we can all have a little exercise climbing the hills and a little internet exercise not being identified. And I get some exercise climbing trees too, which is always not fun for me. But we, we don't hear the higher centers telling us what to do all the time because of these mechanical parts in the traffic of life. And the traffic of life is the noise in your head. It's the emotional static that you're hearing all the time. No. <laughs> Just that emotional static that's always going on. The noise in your head is that constant. What about that? It's just that madness, that monkey chatter madness. Sanskrit, they have a word for that. And it sounds like monkeys chattering. It's like chitta, chitta, or something like that. See, when you hear it, it's like, yeah, I know that one. Because <laughs> you can hear it in your head. It's like a and that's the mechanical bit that I'm talking about. And that's what keeps us from hearing what the higher centers are telling us to do. Gurdjieff used to say, I can work. This is so beautiful. Three words, I can work. How can I get so emotional about this? I can work. I can get so emotional about this because this is my only hope. No matter what happens, I can work. What does that mean? It means the beauty of the fourth way is no matter what happens in life, I can work. I don't have to be in church. I don't have to be in a yoga position. I don't have to be in the monastery. I don't have to be meditating. I don't have to have any of that. Whatever happens in life, anywhere, anytime, I can work. Man, can you feel the power of that? Can you feel the hope in that? Can you see the light in that? I can work. I can apply these principles, I can apply these ideas right here, right now to this situation, to this mind chatter, to this emotional static, to this state, to this event, to this situation, to these objects, to these people, whatever is happening, I can draw it all back in here, I can relate it to my own inner state, and I can work. I can stop the leaks, I can gather the force, I can save it up, even though I can't use it right now, I can save it up for a time and a moment when I can use it. And then I'll use it in the right way at the right time. When the path looks long and difficult, <laughs> and there are times, let's face it, it looks so long and so difficult, we despair. We throw our hands up in despair, say, it's useless, it's hopeless, I'll never make it. When you're feeling defeated, remember, I can work. Right here, right now, I can work. And that was the beauty of Gurdjieff. Back in the early 70s, when I became aware of Gurdjieff and started reading his books and reading about him, I got to tell you, I didn't like the guy. I thought he did a lot of things wrong. I thought it was way too complex that he didn't need to be complex. I thought it was way too harsh when he didn't need to be harsh. I thought it was way too immoral, drinking and doing things that he did, that were reported that he did, that I thought were wrong. You know, the toast to the idiots and the drinking and all that, you know, his armagnac and like that. And you know, now I love the man because he's my teacher. And you have to have a teacher to know what love is. And then you have to become a teacher. And then you have the fullness of love. Now, if you've got a wife or children, you can become their teacher, possibly. Probably not, but possibly. But you become a teacher not by teaching people. You become a teacher by having a teacher and then living what your teacher lived. That's how you become a teacher. And that's how you find out what love is. Anyway, now I love the man because I can remember that I can work right here, right now. Only you can define what real aim is. You've got to make a sufficiently genuine aim, and when you do, the work will then correct it. Because whatever aim you make, if it's sufficiently genuine, whatever aim you make, it's not going to be right. Why? Because we're not outside of ourselves. We don't come from this conscious circle of humanity. We are not the love child of the conscious circle of humanity that has been given to humanity to lift it out of the darkness of its ignorance. And so the work will correct your aim when it needs to be corrected, and it'll put it in the right direction. So don't throw up your hands in despair. Instead, be astounded at the help that you receive along the way. Astounded. I use that word specifically because that's the word I want to use. It is astounding, the help that we get. Astounding. It's mind-boggling. We do not deserve it. There's just no way that anyone who knows anything about themselves, who's ever looked at himself genuinely, can say, I deserve this. You deserve nothing. We are nothing. You look at what we are in this universe. And it's like, we're less than that. Whatever it is that you just imagined, it's less than that. You don't deserve it. So it's astounding that we get it. And we get it consistently. 
It's amazing also at how much what you thought you needed has changed by the work. I started off in this direction and this is what I thought I wanted to do and I find that the work has changed it all and it was right. What I thought was wrong. I didn't know. I didn't know what was best for me. I thought I did. I was sure I did. Then I found that I didn't at all. It can be a humbling experience and it should be, but not all the time. If you will the work, if you have good will toward it, if you have an idea of the good, genuine good, connected with esoteric teachings, you can be certain of one thing. The response that you get from the work will be right, even when your request is wrong. How often <laughs> has your request been wrong? Oh, one just popped into my mind that is gruesome. I really don't even like to think about it. But there it is. Yes, I remember making that request and it was wrong. It was just wrong, but the work corrected it. Why? Because that's what it does. That's what light and love does. It corrects what's wrong. It heals what's broken. And we're broken. We're broken machines and we need healing. And this work brings us the light that will do just that. But we can't use this work for life. A lot of people think they can use this work for life. Well, I'll use this and make a lot of money. Well, I'll use this and get a lot of this. And I'll use this and get... We can't do that. But we can use life for this work. We can turn that around and gobble life up for this work. This work in us can eat life in us. And it's life in us that needs to be eaten. It's the acquired life in us that needs to be eaten, that needs to be made passive, so that it's no longer the eater. But the real you is the eater, the fake you, the you that life built up, that becomes eaten by the eater. If we could make the work the first thing, number one in our lives, everything else would be added to us. A lot of you who have a religious background will say, that sounds like what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you as well. And that's good, because it's true. Because if you will seek first the kingdom of God, which is, and his righteousness, which is basically what this work is offering, the rightness of life, the rightness of who you could be, not what you are, but who you could be, what you could be, the rightness of that. The kingdom of God is where God rules, where right rules, where good rules. Well, where's that? Well, there's going to have to be within, because if you look outside, you'll notice it's not out there, nowhere out there. Now, God bless the people who are out there with picket signs and so on and so forth, trying to make it out there. It's never going to happen because it's an inside job. It's got to happen in here first. When it happens in here first, then it will naturally occur out there. It won't be forced. It won't be legislated. You won't have to have a picket sign. You won't have to slam into somebody's face to prove to them that they're wrong. Compassion again, compassion. Where's the compassion in that? Well, there isn't any. That's how you know there's something wrong with it. There isn't any. But I've got compassion for those people who are doing that because they can't do anything else. They don't know another way. They think they're right. How many times have I thought I was right in what I was doing? And it was wrong. But the work corrected me. If I was sincere. If I was genuine. If I wasn't, it'll be patient and wait until I am. If we could put the work first, we begin to live the work in life. We begin to connect everything that we do in life with the work, even artificially at first. At first, you imitate the dance step. <laughs> you're not dancing, trust me. <laughs> you know, I've seen people dance, that's not dancing. But you're imitating the dance step. And if you imitate that dance step long enough, maybe the music will start to loosen you up and maybe you will start to get a feeling for it. And maybe when you start to get a feeling for it, you won't be imitating it anymore, you'll be dancing. And that's what we look for with this work. We look for the feeling, the emotion behind it, the music, to start to fill the artificial robot moves we make. And then when it does, the next thing you know, you're dancing. And somebody else says, look at that guy dance. Try to act as if everything you do in life has a connection with the work. Don't make the work opposite to life. Gurdjieff said, bring all things into the work. Don't go into life as relaxation from the work, but connect your relaxation in life with the work. The idea is that you're in the work. It's your choice. You are in the work because you chose to be in the work. Nobody plunked you down here. You weren't born into it. Nobody's born into this. Well, maybe somebody is. But I don't know who they are. I don't know anybody who was born into this work. I've read about people who were, but I don't know anybody. The people I know chose it. People I know walked into it with their eyes partially open. I say partially open because their eyes were not open. Their eyes started to open once they got here. And they're still not open, but it doesn't matter. They're more open than they were. But if you're negative, you're negative in the work. If you speak against the work, remember that it's in the work. If you go off the deep end, it's in the work. It's funny, Jess came to me yesterday and was talking about he and Jennifer got into it. And they went off the deep end. 
I mean, they got in one of those arguments where, you know, the ones mm -hmm. where you're screaming and yelling at each other and cursing at each other, you know, the whole thing. And they said when they were done, they went, well, you feel better? <laughs> well, yes, I do. <laughs> because they did it in the work. I don't know that he could have told me that that way. But the way my mind works is I looked at that and I just nodded and said, yeah, and left. But I didn't say much to him about it. But it's true. You go off the deep end, you're going off the deep end in the work. I went off the deep end last night, barking, and, uh, and I did it in the work. I looked at it and I went, well, I didn't want to do that. And I went and laid down on the sofa and looked at my breathing and it was, <sighs> I was mad. You know, I was in a negative state and I said, okay, you're in a negative state. Now get out of it. And I didn't know the way. I couldn't find the way out. I could not find the door, man. I mean, I was looking everywhere and it just was not there. There were no windows. There were no doors. It was like hermetically sealed. I was hermetically <laughs> sealed in this negative state. I was thinking, how do I get out of here? I didn't get claustrophobic. I just said, okay, fine. Then I'm in a negative state. I'll just lie here and be negative. And I was negative in the work. And you know what? Next thing I knew, I wasn't negative anymore. I don't know how it happened. I got some kind of help. That's all I can say. Some kind of help came from somewhere into this hermetically sealed hell that I had made for myself. And because it was my volition to be out of it, I got yanked out when I couldn't yank myself out. Feel this, and you won't divide yourself into work eyes and life eyes. If you're in the work, you can't be out of it. If you got negative eyes, oh well. I think the work isn't aware of human nature. <laughs> it knows all about human nature. All about human nature. You know, I talk about the work like it's this being. Well, it is. It's an organism. It's alive. It's real. It's alive. It has thoughts. It has feelings. It has a direction. It has warmth. It can be hot. It can be cold. It has power. It's something. It's something so much bigger than anything we've ever known. It's huge. It contains the universe in a thought. It contains billions of universes in a phrase. It's huge. It's what some people would call God, but we won't call it God because they've sullied the word. It's tragic what we do with words. It's tragic what we do with ideas. It's tragic what we do. But we can't help ourselves because of our limited consciousness. We can only perceive what we perceive. We can only do what we do. We need help. Now, the work is not exactly ignorant of human nature. Trust me on this. In fact, don't trust me on this. Verify it yourself. You can't live now in the work and now in life. That'll make a split in you. A balanced man includes everything in the right place and in the right order. And so I look at Gurdjieff and I think, well, he drank Armagnac. I don't drink. Well, that's just my choice, that's all. I, I know lots of people who drink, and that's fine by me. It's just my choice not to drink. Well, he ate meat. I don't eat meat. So, it's just my choice not to eat meat. I don't rule anyone out of my life because they eat meat. That's their business. I'm not here to try and get other people to live like I live. I'm here to understand how to live and to help other people understand how to live a real life. Those outer things, they're not that important. They'll be put in their right order, in the right time, in the right way, at the right moment. It's none of my business. There's something bigger than me that can deal with that. Remember, the even bad animals were taken into Noah's Ark. It wasn't just, you know, what would they take mosquitoes for? What are you, what are you, ticks? What a mistake. I got to talk to Noah about this, you know. Noah, snakes, man, like poisonous snakes. Well, what were you thinking? What about the, the brown recluse spider? What were you thinking? What were you thinking? I wasn't thinking. I was just taking orders. He was just obeying. Okay, I can understand that. I've done a lot of obeying when I didn't know why, and it worked out. So, okay, but Noah took the bad animals too. So remember that even the bad animals were taken. We can develop as we are. And the reason we can develop as we are is because we've got a bad side. <laughs> you notice you've got a bad side? Did you notice there's a lot of power in that bad side? Did you notice there's not a lot of power in the good side? It's a little kind of... Crippled, weak, you know, watered down. But the bad side's got energy and power. Use that energy and that power. The work will use that energy and that power because you can't really develop without a bad side. Oh, happy day, good for us. We can't develop without a bad side, and we've got big bad sides. Even eyes which are not in the work are useful and in the work. Even negative eyes are useful if we know how not to identify with them. If you don't identify with them, they are useful. If you're identified, you're useful to the bad eye, to the negative eye. Then you're useful. Then it's going to drag you around like you've got a big brass ring in your nose. Even if you're a big bull of a person, it's going to drag you around like a puppy. There's nothing you can do about it. But if you stop identifying, you cut the leash. 
you basically take the, well, you don't take the ring out of your nose because it's there for some other negative emotion to come along and hook into. We'll learn, though. We'll learn someday we'll get rid of the brass ring in our nose. Someday. Could happen. It's possible. I'm not holding my breath. Real aim has to take second force into consideration. Real aim has to be made cleverly. The first thing you've got to do is rid yourself of the idea of instant gratification. Just get rid of that. It's like that candid camera thing where they took the little kids and they put them in the room, little room, with a marshmallow and a camera that was hidden. I said, okay, if you don't eat this marshmallow, when I come back, if it's still here, I'll give you two. But if you eat it, you don't get another one. And, there was some, and then they, the guy would leave. And then the camera would just roll and a little kid. And the kids would look oh, funny, man. One of them would pick up the marshmallow and just sniff it. Oh, and put it back down. And sniff it again. Oh, put it back down. Some would lick it. They'd lick it, put it back down. Lick it some more and put it back down. Uh, lick it some more and put it back down. Somebody was really clever. He hollowed out the inside from the bottom of it. He hollowed out the inside, ate that part, and then put it back down so it looked like the whole marshmallow was there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm talking. I'm talking. Think about what we do. But think about us. So this is how clever the acquired consciousness. This is how clever the machine is when it wants what it wants. Whereas the real you with integrity would say, okay, fine, I either want it, oh, I'm eating it, because I don't want two marshmallows, thank you very much. Boom, eats the marshmallow, that's the end of that. Okay, what's next? Got a grapefruit? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> there were some kids who just sat there, resolute, arms crossed, a stern look on their face like Mount Rushmore. They wouldn't even look at the marshmallow. The marshmallow does not exist. I am a rock. I will not eat the marshmallow. I will get two marshmallows and eat them both at my leisure. So there are people like that. The savers. Steve can identify with that guy. Yep, I wouldn't touch that marshmallow. <laughs> I'd get the whole bag if he gave me a chance, boy. <laughs> you know, so I'll sit here until they bring the whole stale bag of marshmallows in. Then I won't be able to eat any of them without breaking my teeth. I'll end up at the dentist spending my whole fortune on getting my teeth fixed. Uh, well, you know how that goes. And am I making fun of you? Well, maybe a little. We map out our course in the same way that a sailor may map out a course, a navigator. Somebody who's the navigator on a sailboat, on a sailing ship. And he maps out the course. Okay, this is where we've got to go. But the master of the ship, he knows that there's no way they're going directly to that. He knows he has to sail to it. He knows he's going to have to tack north and south and east and west. He knows that the wind is going to be contrary sometimes. He knows that there's not going to be any wind sometimes. He knows that sometimes the, the tides are going to be contrary. The waves are going to be contrary. The weather is not going to work the way he wants it to work. So he doesn't expect to go directly to his goal, but he will reach it in spite of the weather and the contrary winds. He will reach it. The master of the ship will reach it because he knows, because he's a good captain, because he sailed a lot, because he has experience, because he understands something that people who don't sail don't understand, but people who don't have the experience don't understand. Think what real aim is in contrast to temporary, but useful aim. They have a lot of temporary aims. They're very useful. But they're not real aim. They're just supporting aims, like a supporting actor or supporting actress. And if they're doing their job, they're very useful. But they're not the main thing. Without the idea of a higher level of humanity, conscious circle of humanity, a better state of humanity than anything that we see here on Earth, it's difficult to make real aim. And the reason I spent so much time on the conscious circle of humanity this morning and the work as an organism, as a love child of the conscious circle of humanity, yeah, I know I made that all up while I was talking, but see, I don't make it up because I listen to higher centers sometimes and that's what I hear. Now, that may not be, those may not be the words, but that's the best I can translate the taste, the feel, the sense of the state. And it's a good translation. I'll stick with it for now. All the ideas and concepts of the work are needed to make real aim. All of them. That, and also that we be dissatisfied with our level of being and feel the possibility of change. If you're satisfied with the way you are, you're in the wrong place. You're just in the wrong place. Now, if you're satisfied with the way you are as, well, it's the way I am. Let's get to work. That's different. That's not being sated. That's being at peace with the process, not the state. Being at peace with the process. So I may not, I'm not there, but I'm also not anxious about that. I'm not fretting over that because I'm working, because I can work. It doesn't matter where I am. Well, but you have 10,000 lifetimes before you'll make it. I don't care. I can work. I have something now. I have something that I'll always have. I have this work. There's a connection deep inside of me with this work and my soul. I can work. 
No matter what happens in the future, I can work. I can work. What's there not to be happy about? It's like the master of a sailing ship. He knows he's going to get there. He doesn't know how many storms are going to come up. Maybe a typhoon, maybe a hurricane, maybe this or maybe that. He doesn't care. He cares. It's like, well, I'd rather that didn't happen. I'll avoid that at all costs if I can. But when the unexpected comes up, he'll deal with it according to his understanding and according to his real faith, his experience and his knowledge and his confident expectation that help will come just when he needs it.